All right, let's get started with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we uh, come to you this morning. We want to thank you uh, for your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to join together this morning, Lord, and to continue the study as we continue to uh, highlight, Lord, your grace and your work of uh, of salvation, Lord, that you have uh, bestowed upon us. We just pray that you would bless our time together, open our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, uh, lesson four, uh, limited atonement, is where we're at this morning. As you know, we've been walking through the doctrines of grace. We've been walking through the acronym TULIP. And today we land on the L of TULIP, the, uh, the doctrine of limited atonement. So let's go ahead and define it. Now, limited atonement, Definition. Limited atonement is the doctrine that states that the death of Jesus only atoned for the sins of the elect, leading them to salvation. Christ died for the sins of the elect alone, and no atonement was provided for the reprobate. Somebody read John 10, 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Right, so we, we would say that the sheep are, are, are those that belong in the... In, in, the, in the shepherd's pen, right? So uh, the analogy that, that, that Christ makes often is him being a shepherd to his sheep, my sheep hear my voice and so forth. So we would say that when, when Christ laid down his life, he laid down his life specifically for the sheep, for his sheep, those that, that are in his fold. Uh, limited atonement, the L in the acronym of TULIP, is a doctrine that has historically had the most opposition. It is shocking for many people to hear that Christ only died for the elect and not die for everyone. So, yeah, this, this doctrine, out of all the ones we're going to be looking at, uh, from the acronym TULA, has been the, the one that has caused most controversy. Because, uh, you know, when, on face value, uh, on surface, when you look at it on the surface, that, that Christ, and, and hear the words that Christ only died for the elect, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't strike well with a lot of people, right? Because we're, we, we've, we've grown up... You know, hearing that, you know, Christ died for all. And that's even the way we evangelize a lot of times, right? Uh, you know, come to Christ. Christ died for you and so forth. So you hear a lot of people evangelizing in that way. Um, something, you know, if you, if you read church history, that kind of uh, way of thinking has been popularized maybe in the Second Great Awakening with Charles Finney and the, the big, uh, you know, uh, revivals of conversion and so forth, personal conversion. But if you look even before that, before the Second Great Awakening, before even in the First Great Awakening, which was more uh, Calvinistic, as you would say, when you had people like uh, Jonathan Edwards and uh, George Whitfield and so forth, this wasn't controversial at all, limited atonement. This is the way people understood their Bible and so forth. It's more controversial to people today because I think most people today have grown up or out of the evangelistic culture that comes out of the Second Great Awakening, which is the revivalism of Charles Finney. Uh, more, more uh, I guess a more modern contemporary would be Billy Graham and so forth, right? So we, not saying these guys are bad. I'm not throwing them in, under the bus or anything. But what I'm saying is their, their style of, of teaching and their theology of, of salvation has uh, been prevalent to evangelicalism. I think most uh, people that do get saved get saved under that type of theology, hearing that Christ died for everyone, hearing that Christ so. But this is controversial to us. I guess I'm trying to say is this is controversial to us, the way it sounds. Throughout church history, it was never really a controversy. This is the way people really understood the scriptures. So uh, many theologians prefer the term definite atonement rather than limited atonement. Definite atonement better describes the effectiveness of the atonement, meaning that the death of Christ was clear and purposeful rather than vague and uncertain. So again, it's a word that um, I believe R.C. Spro has come up with, definite atonement. He likes to use that word, and many of people have picked up on that. Uh, I, I, I personally like the way definite atonement sounds a lot better than limited atonement. Again, limited atonement seems to uh, convey something more negative, where definite atonement seems to convey something more, more positive, like this is definitely what Christ did. He came to purchase uh, salvation for those in his fold, right? So I like the term definite atonement, but, uh, but again, it doesn't fit in the TULIP acronym. Uh, so uh, we're good. What's, this, this doctrine is known as limited atonement. So for us to understand and get a better grasp on this doctrine, it'll, it'll be helpful for us to understand what atonement actually is. Let's go into that a little bit. To better understand limited atonement, 
it would help if we had a better understanding of what atonement is. Atonement is the process by which obstacles are removed that has kept us from forgiveness, favor, and fellowship with God. It is often attached to sacrifice, which connects ritual cleanness with being accepted by God. So we see this right in the very beginning, right? Adam and Eve had this fellowship. They had this communion with God that was lost because of sin. And because of sin, and because of their separation for God, they needed some type of work of atonement, something to bring them back into fellowship. And we see this being instituted all the way back in the Old Covenant. There was a way that God was able to forgive the sins of His people in the Old, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 59, 2. Somebody read that there. Sin has separated us from God, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Right, so there we see, you know, um, in, in Scripture, where sin has separated us from God. I mean, we obviously know that. That's why we, we understand we need salvation, because we need to be saved from something. We need to be saved from that, that fellowship, that, that oneness that we once had from God. So uh, we know that Scripture teaches that there has been a separa separation because of our sins. And then we read in Hebrews 9.22, somebody can read, if somebody can read that. Only blood can wash away sins. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Right, so there is a separation because of our sins, and we needed forgiveness, and we know that only the blood, only blood can wash away sins. Only blood can offer this forgiveness. And again, if we go back to the Old Testament, we see this. Now let's look a little bit deeper about, uh, let's look a little bit deeper at the way atonement worked in the Old Testament, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and read that for sake of time. Uh, that is in Leviticus 16, 15 through 18. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgression all their sins and so he shall do for the for the tent of meetings which dwells with them in the midst of the uncleanness no one may be in the tent of meetings from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for the for his house and for all the assembly of Israel then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around so if you have any familiarity with the Old Testament and the Old, Old Covenant, you will know that this is something they did. This is something that was commanded by God. Because of your sin, you needed to atone for your sin. And the way they atoned for their sins was through the blood of goats and bulls. And it was a priest that was supposed to go into the, into the, uh, the altar, to the altar, and offer this sacrifice and offer this atonement for him and the people of Israel. So again, whose sins did the priest atone for? The blood of goats had a definite application. It atoned for the sins of the priests, and it atoned for the people of Israel. It did not cover the sins of those outside of Israel. It was, it was a, an atonement that was specific. It was an atonement that was definite. Whenever the priest went into uh, the, the, uh, the, the place, to, the tent of meetings, whenever he went in to offer sacrifice and offer atonement, he had a definite people in mind that this atonement was going to go for. It wasn't just for everyone. It wasn't for Egypt. It wasn't for, every, for people in the, in the Near East that were doing their own thing and serving their own gods. This atonement in the priest's mind and in God's mind, when, they, when he was offering the sacrifice, it had, a de, it had a definite purpose. It was for a specific people. It was for the people of Israel and, and those in the covenant community of Israel. So in the, again, in the Old Testament, the blood of goats and bulls only covered the sins of God's covenant people which is Israel. Likewise, in the New Testament, the blood of Christ only covers the sins of God's new covenant people, which is the church, which is the elect, right? So you see that, that transformation there. In the Old Testament, the, the priest would go offer sins for atonement for the covenant people, which is Israel. In the New Testament, Christ, who is the high priest, who is the great high priest, offers himself as the sacrifice, just like in the Old Testament, for a definite people, for the elect, for his church. The author of Hebrews labors at the connection between the Old Covenant atonement and the New Covenant atonement. 
Although the Old Covenant atonement was only able to cover for sins, the New Covenant atonement is able to remove sins. So there's a difference there, too. If you look at the Old Testament, it was able to, the blood of goats and bulls was able to cover sins and never completely remove sins. This is why Christ's blood is greater. Uh, verse 13 in Hebrews uh, 9, 13, Hebrews 9, 13 through 15. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons which the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. Hebrews 9, 13 through 15. And notice in this passage, notice who receives the promise through the sacrifice. Verse 15 tells us it is those who are called. We talked about that right before, right? Those who have been called by God, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Those are the ones who receive the atonement. Just as the atonement of goats and bulls were limited to Israel, whom God called in, the, in the, his people in the old covenant, it is also limited to the elect whom God called in the new covenant. Again, there was a calling in the old covenant. There was a calling in the Old Testament. When he called, that first call when he came to Abraham and said, you know, these are going to be my people. You know, through you, every descendant, every nation will be blessed. There was a calling there. And there's also a calling in the new covenant. Those called uh, by, um, by Christ. So we see there atonement in the old covenant was definite, limited to a certain people, to covenant people. This is what we see in the New Testament as well. That atonement is definite and limited to the new covenant people, which again is broader than the nation of Israel. It is broader than just uh, Jews alone. It is people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. It is the elect of God. It is the church. So who benefits from Christ's death? We need to talk about this a little bit. So uh, Brother Ron had brought up this text last week when we were talking about uh, some of the, the text to, to, kind of to kind of define and flesh out a little bit. So let, let's, let's go to John 3.16 and we have it there. If somebody wants to go ahead and read it, you might probably know it by memory. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Right. Famous text. It's even Hold up at signs at football games. I don't know if you've ever seen that, like in the crowd. <laughs> right? Famous text. I, I've actually heard somebody come to Christ through that. I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a story about that through a sign. So famous text, uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, whoever believes in him. So the doctrine of election does not deny that God loves the world, right? Uh, I think there are some who, who would deny that. I agree. There are some that are uh, more of who we call stage cage Calvinist, angry Calvinist, uh, uh, that, that would deny that God loves the world, but I don't think most people would deny that God loves the world. Theologians have dis distinguished between God's providential love or common love and God's special love that he has for the elect. So providential, obviously it's in the word. We know what that means. He, he provides for people every day. We've talked about this before. Every day the people that hate God are provided for. Uh, they're cared for. Uh, they receive uh, common uh, gifts th that they're allowed to enjoy food, a family. Uh, and these, are, these are heathens, right? Heathens are enjoying such good gifts from God. So we see God's common love that he has for the world. That we don't have a problem with God, with John 3, 16 saying God so loved the world. So in one sense, uh, the entire world benefits from the sacrificial work of Christ because of, because of the death of Christ, sinners repent of their sins and turn to God and their godly lives are a benefit to the entire world. So again, going back to the question, who does Christ a death benefit we would say it benefits everyone in, in in a general way because through the death of Christ people are called to salvation because of Christ's death people are able to get saved and when people are getting saved what does that do to to the community what does that do to the world it transforms the world in, in, a, in, a, in a in a way people are are living better lives people are more faithful to their husbands and wives and raising up godly families and so forth and this this kind of has an effect to the culture and to the gener and to and to the world at large so we would say that the fact that that, that Christ's uh, work saves people has a, a benefit for the entire world uh, you know i've been reading a lot of uh, Recently, I've been reading a lot of uh, American history. You look at the founders of the country. Uh, you know, they weren't real. They weren't really Christians, uh, like 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 we would define Christians. 
Uh, but they believed in, in Christianity and they believed in the Bible because they, they wanted a just society and they wanted a good society. They wanted America to be a, a just place and they wanted people to, to live right. And they knew that the way people live right is if they were believers and they followed the Bible, if they had good morals. They didn't really care about personal salvation and sin and death and sin and hell and all that stuff. But they, they cared about morals. They wanted people to live good lives because they knew that that would affect the society. So uh, I, again, if you look at uh, the question, who does Christ's death benefit? Well, the fact that people are converted and do live good lives, it really benefits the whole world in one sense. Uh, some have argued that John's use of world in John 3.16, uh, cosmos in the Greek, means that which is contrary to God. Uh, they argue this because other verses in the New Testament speak of world as whatever opposes God, do not love the world, 1 John 2.15 through 16, and friendship with the world is the enmity of Christ, uh, John 4, 4. So some have said, well, what, what, what's, what John is getting at there, and it makes a strong argument because John does use the same word in 1 John 2, 15, if we're, we're to believe that's the same author. He does use world in a different way. He uses world as that which opposes God. Like when we think of worldly things, right, worldly music, worldly movies or whatever, that which is against God. So uh, that could be a possibility. Again, even if, to me personally, even if John means the general world, all the people, I have no problem with God loving that because we, we do believe in his providential and common love. He does love the world. However, when we look at John 3, 16, the key word in that text is not world. Most will concede that God has a general, common, and providential love for the world. The key word is the verse, in the verse is whosoever. The whosoever that believes in the Son is, 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 is the elect, is the one who Christ died for, is, is only able to believe in are Those are the people that are only able to believe in him because the Spirit has given them faith to believe. Again, Ephesians 2.8, you are not saved by, by your own works. It is a gift, right? Faith is a gift that has been given. So although Christ's death benefits the entire world in one sense, his death particularly benefits the whosoever of John 3 16 those who believe in him those who have, those who believe in Christ receive Christ and receive the benefits of Christ's atoning death so I have there the big question understanding limited atonement comes down to one simple question if Christ died for the sins of the whole world which means every person in the world then why isn't the whole world again every person in the world forgiven of their sins. Since the purpose of atonement, as we've seen already, is to atone for sins, then to say Christ died for everyone is to say that Christ atoned for everyone's sin. Just like that, that, that priest in Israel that went and atoned for, for, for certain people. If we're saying that the death applies to everyone, then if we're looking at, if we're looking at what Christ's uh, death means, it's atonement, then we would say that that atonement applies to every person in the world. Then the logical conclusion is that every person in the world is, 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 has their sins forgiven. If Christ truly atoned for everyone's sin, then everyone will be saved. Uh, somebody read Ephesians 1.7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Right, so again, uh, Paul talking to a church there, talking to a saved group, talking to the elect, saying, we are the ones that have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Again, we're talking about the doctrines of grace. This is God's grace that is bestowed upon his elect. It is the blood of Christ that redeems. It is the blood of Christ that forgives. And it is the blood of Christ that atones for sins and removes the barrier between the sinner and God. If the blood of Christ paid for entire world, meaning every person in the world, then the entire world is forgiven and reconciled to God. I, I think that is the logical conclusion. If the blood of Christ that redeems, like we read in Ephesians 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. So again, if we do have redemption through His blood, if we do have forgiveness through His blood, if we do have a reconciliation through His blood, then to say that His blood atoned for every single person in the world would would pretty much say that every person in the world has this forgiveness and um, and redemption and reconciliation to God so here's some implications deny limited atonement has a few glaring implications if we would deny limited atonement it does and I, I, and, and look, again these are things that a lot of people haven't thought through so I think that sometimes uh, you know guys uh, on, on our side that believe in the doctrines of grace kind of are a little heavy-handed 
uh, with some of our, our theology uh, because, you know, we're saying, how can you not see this? You know, we didn't, some of us didn't see this our entire life, right? So we need to not, not be so heavy-handed and, and, and understand that people haven't really thought some of these things through. So here's some implications. Denying limited atonement has a few glaring implications. First, as I mentioned, if Christ died for everyone's sin, then everyone's sins are forgiven, and this would lead to the her heretical view of universalism. Again, that's a view, a doctrine that's been denied by the history of the church, that's saying that everyone will get saved, that everyone will eventually find their way to God. Um, you know, a lot of people believe that, that there are many roads to God, that you could come to God in many ways. Uh, so people would say that, you know, everybody winds up in heaven. Now, you might have to go through some, some places. You might have to go to hell for a little bit or purgatory or whatever, whatever however people might define their, their view of that. Uh, universal is, universalism is a her heretical doctrine. We would say that scripture is clear that you must come to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. There is, no by, there is no other way under heaven or no other name under heaven by which men should be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. We believe that scripture is very clear on the exclusivity of Christ. So to say that Christ uh, somehow died for everyone's sin, again, will, the logical conclusion will lead to a view of universalism. Universalism is the belief that everyone will eventually go to heaven. This means that the sinner can never turn to Christ and live as they please, but they will, they will still be accepted by God because Christ died for their sins. Uh, I would say that the practical implication on that is... Um, it's very real. Uh, you know, sometimes as I've, I've been out street witnessing and I've talked to some people, I've seen this kind of view before. People not willing to come to Christ because maybe they grew up in the church and they've heard so long that Christ died for their sins. You know, that, oh, Christ died for this. So they, they, they have this belief that, man, it's already done and I can really live the way I want and live my life apart from God because Christ already died for my sin. And, you know, it's taken care of. I, I punched my ticket to heaven in a way. So, uh, you know, I, I have seen personally, I have seen these implications. It leads to uh, uh, nominal Christianity. Uh, it leads to uh, kind of wishy-washy Christianity. I think a lot of, um, you know, seeker churches and stuff kind of uh, use that type of language and excuses people because they, they, they say, you know what, I, I, I can do whatever I want. I, I can live my life however I want because... My, 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 my penalty has already been paid for. Now, we do believe in, 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 in the sufficiency of, of Christ's atoning work. We do believe that once it's paid for, we'll talk about that when we get to perseverance of the saints. We do believe in, in God preserving. But uh, just to, to say that you know, Christ died uh, for everyone's sin, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a view that is dangerous uh, and it has implications. So the second implication of the, the denial of a major Christian doctrine is a, oh, I'm sorry, is a denial of a major Christian doctrine called penal substitution. Anybody ever heard that word, penal substitution, or substitutionary atonement, right? So penal substitution means that Christ, by his own sacrificial choice, was punished, penalized, that's where we get the word penal, in the place of sinners, substitution, thus satisfying the demands of justice so God can justly forgive sins, right? So... Now, let me, let me just kind of insert this here. Uh, there are varying views of the cross. I understand that. Not everybody holds to penal substitution uh, that the cross uh, was this substitutionary atonement. Uh, if you have a view, uh, which I believe is outside of the, of, of, uh, of the history of the Christian faith, if you have a view that says that the cross was somehow, I've heard this before, maybe a ransom uh, to the devil to free people from their sin, um, you know, there's some other theories out there about what the cross actually accomplished. Of course, you got the liberation theology that teaches something totally different. So you're going to have all these varying views of the cross. But I think the church, church history and church orthodoxy has always taught that the, the doctrine of the cross, or when we look at the cross, that is a substitutionary atonement. That is Christ atoning for the sins of his people. That is Christ uh, satisfying the demands of justice. Again, the wages of sin is death. Okay, the wages of sin is death, and why don't we die? Well, because Christ took our place on the cross, and he received the, the penalty for us so that we cannot claim injustice in God. We can't say that God let us all free. He didn't let us all free. He, incur, he did, he did uh, punish sin, although the punishment didn't come to us. It came to Christ on the cross. Right, so that is penal substitution. Um, the the clear the clearest place we see this is Isaiah fifty three five and six. If somebody wants to read that, but he was pierced for our transgressions; he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Right. So many, many Jews will deny this, but we believe that Isaiah there is talking about Christ, right? That Isaiah is saying that, uh, you know, the Lord has laid him. Who is the him there? It is Christ. He has laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all, right? So he, God has, has come and he has laid on Christ. I mean, Christ has come and he has received uh, the, the just penalty on our behalf. So the glaring question for those that would deny limited atonement is how can Christ die in the place of sinners Yet sinners still be sent to hell. The implication is that sinners' sin is paid twice. Once by Christ on the cross, and then by, and then by them in hell. This would seem to make God unjust. So there's a double punishment going on there if we would deny limited atonement, right? So if we would say that, um, that Christ died for, for this particular sinner, uh, let's, let's just throw a name out there. Let's say Joseph, right? Okay, Christ, Christ's death... Uh, atoned for Joseph's sins because he died for Joseph's sins and again we believe that Christ's death was atonement Christ's death atoned for Joseph's sins who never repented of his sins who came to Christ or who, I mean who never repented of his sins and came to Christ and then went to hell so we would say that Joseph's sins were paid for twice one by Christ and one by Joseph in hell so that's 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 where deny the denial of limited atonement would, would, would fall. A third implication is that the sufficiency of Christ's death is in the hands of sinners, not in Christ. We say that Christ's death is sufficient for all, but only applied to the elect whom God has gifted faith to believe. So when we talk about limited atonement, again, this is why a lot of theologians like to stay, stay away from that word limited, because it brings to mind that, is, that, that Christ's death or Christ's blood is not powerful to save everybody. That's not what limited atonement teaches, and that's not what people that believe in limited atonement believe. We believe that his blood is sufficient. It is able to save if he wanted to save every single person in the world, but he chose to only apply this to those who he set apart from the foundation of the earth. He chose to only apply it to the elect. If Christ truly died for the sins of those who will never believe, then part of his death was in vain. In other words, Christ suffered for sins that would never be forgiven. Part of his suffering was in vain because it didn't accomplish anything. This would seem to make man sovereign, not God. When I think of limited atonement, me personally, this part is really the part that, that has me sold. And, and I don't know, I, I, I see, when I see Christ, I don't see a weak Christ. I don't see a begging Christ. I don't see a Christ that uh, um, is going to... Um, allow you know uh, sin to, 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 to defeat him he's a victorious Christ and when I think about limited atonement or the denial of limited atonement I think about Christ suffering for sins I believe he suffered for specific sins he suffered for sins that are, are gonna be forgiven because because again I mean Christ took took with him sins to the cross our sins every one of us who are saved he took those sins with him to the cross and he paid for those sins and he suffered for those sins. And to think that Christ took sins in vain of people that would never come to him. Because again, everyone, no one, I don't think anyone denies foreknowledge. Everyone, I don't think anyone denies that God knows who's going to be saved or not. So to say that Christ carried the sin again of that, <laughs> made a person named Joseph. He carried that sin to the cross. And he, he suffered for that sin, knowing that, that that sin wouldn't accomplish anything. To me, that seems like the death of Christ in a way would, would, would be vain. And that would seem like the, 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 the effectual work of the blood of the cross lies not in Christ, but it lies on the sinner, whether I accept it or not. So in other words, in order for the blood of Christ to be effective, it relies on me, on a sinner like me. I'm the one that decides if this blood is going to be effective or not, if I choose Christ or I deny Christ. To me, I'd rather say, no, I think God is sovereign. I think Scripture says, teaches clearly that salvation is of the Lord, and His blood is effective, and it's effective for the elect. So let's go to some objective, or probably the biggest objective text. We're going to spend the last week when we look at the acronym TULIP. I want to spend the last week, week looking at some more texts that, that people will bring to kind of oppose the doctrines of grace. So we'll spend that, that last Sunday looking at some more texts. But I think we've got to mention one today because this text here has, 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 has been brought up when discussing limited atonement. And that's 1 John 2.2. 2. Let me read it. 
He is the propitiation, propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? So if you take that, that text right there at face value, it seems that John is saying that the propitiation, the atonement, is not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. So what is he getting at there? If we, if, if we know that, or if we're saying that Christ's death is limited to the elect, how can John say that it's, it's for the whole world? So again, those that use this as a proof text against living atonement assuming, are assuming too much. Again, to assume that Christ is the propitiation, the appeasement, of the sins of every person in the whole world would mean that every person in the whole world would be saved. Why? Because the logical conclusion is that the propitiation, the appeasement, has been given to everyone. Everyone's sins have been appeased, right? It, everyone's sin has, has been dealt with, right? It, he is uh, the propitiation truly for every person in the world. John's use of whole world can mean one of two things. It can mean one, the whole world is people throughout the world. In other words, Christ didn't just die for a specific group of people like, again, they were used to. And I think we, I think we got to understand, you know, we were to put ourselves in their place, in their time, in their cultural context. This is kind of something that was very new to them because they've always thought that salvation is, is for the Jews. We're the chosen people. And, I mean, Christ, Christ spent a lot of his time in parables telling, the, telling those people that, look, look, I'm about to take this kingdom from you and give it to others, right? I'm about to take this vineyard from you. He, he spent a lot of time kind of showing them that, that this is, I have sheep in, 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 in other folds here that I'm bringing in. In other words, he was saying that it's not only going to be limited to Jews, it's going to be uh, people of every tribe, nation, and tongue. So if we're, look at, if we're to look at it that way, and John saying, you know what, he's not really... Uh, he's not only the propitiation, he doesn't only appease for the sins of us Jewish people or us in, in, the, in the Near East. He's, 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 uh, he's appeasing the sins of, of those all throughout the world, all types of people. Christ didn't just die for Jewish Christians or Christians in the region, but Christ died for the elect, which encompasses people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And I think if we look at, if we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, we would see world used in this context, world used in all types of people, all types of tongues, all types of tribes. So a second thing whole world could mean, as I mentioned earlier, is every type of person who opposes God. In other words, his propitiation is for every type of sinner, from the smallest sinner to the vilest sinner. Again, John has used world like that before when he, when he said, uh, you know, uh, do not love the world or the things in it. Now, he wasn't talking about do not love every person in the world. He was saying do not love the world as opposed to, to Christ. So if John, the same author here in 1 John 2, 2, is using the same word, you know, and, and we know that it can't mean that he's the propitiation for every single person of the world because they would all be saved and that would lead to universalism. Uh, one thing that he could be meaning is that he's the appeasement of the whole world. Anyway, all, in, in other words, all that encompasses the world, every type of sin or every, time, every type of thing that opposes God, whether it's a small sin to a great sin, this is the type of God uh, that he is. He's able to save all types of sinners, whether uh, a small sinner or a vile sinner. So um, that is what we have today on limited atonement. I'm sure there are questions, so let's 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 open it up if there's any. I don't have my. <laughs> sorry, I, I I think I dropped it on the way back, uh, bringing it back because I took it to the to the room over there. So don't have that. So we can't put them on the board. But any questions? I have a question, Pastor. Sure, brother. This. Paragraph up where it says a third implication is that the sufficiency of Christ's death is in the hands of sinners, not in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, we say that Christ's death is sufficient for all, but only applied to the elect, whom God has given, whom God has gifted faith to believe. I view scripture in, in, in this life. Whenever I was going through school, uh, one of the things that they stressed was the importance of how Greek is it's known as the Holy Ghost language capable of exact it's the only language in the world that's capable of exact expression it means exactly what it says it says exactly what it means so just keep in mind that that's that's the the lens that I've used scripture for. right 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 and in Romans chapter 12 verse 3 talking about this paragraph that I just read it says I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That scripture, right, I mean, that paragraph right there uh, alludes to the fact that those who are saved are saved because they have been gifted with faith to believe. Mm -hmm. But this scripture in Romans says that uh, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith or the measure of faith. Right, so you're reading from the King James? No, it's uh, the, I believe it's the NASB. NASB, okay. So I'm just trying to kind of uh, uh, get clear your question here. So uh, would would you say that maybe that 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 text there is implying that everyone has been given this faith, like a measure, a small faith, enough to believe? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna can I can I flesh that out more? Because that's gonna be a whole less. That that's when we talk about the uh, irresistible grace, the I in 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 tulip. That's pretty much encompasses the whole thing about this okay. grace that 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 is given to people and how that works. So yeah, that's a great question because I think we'll probably handle that text there too as well. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that um, I think there's some some issues. For, we would say there was some, there's some problems with um, with what, what people call prevenient grace, like you know that God gives some people some grace to believe. Um, but we'll, we'll flesh that out a little bit more because yeah? that's Catholic Catholics really hold to that doctrine as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any others? Uh, sure. So, um, in the section, the big question, mm -hmm. um, I guess just historically, in the Old Testament, when they would do the sacrifices and the atonements, mm -hmm. was it like the priest would offer up the atonement and then it was like one and done and it was completed? Right. Um, I, or was it like, I guess the Israelites didn't have the option of like accepting it, which is like, they were, you know what I mean? Like accepting or denying that you know atonement, I mean? right? Yeah. 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 See, the way it worked in the Old Testament, it was more of a covenant community. So yeah, it, it really covered the whole, the whole covenant people, the mm -hmm. whole body, even if you were, you know, the worst Israelite. It, it covered your sin in a sense of covenant blessings. Now, we got to understand there was a difference there because that wasn't salvation. Mm -hmm. so we, would say, we would always say that salvation, even in the old covenant, was faith. Now, they might have not known it was faith in Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. They, were just, they, were, they had faith in a promise, in a promised seed. So we would say salvation, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, everyone was saved by, by grace through faith, um, even in that promise However, that atonement wasn't really a salvific atonement. It was more of a covering of their sins so they can continue uh, to receive the covenant blessings as a covenant community. So there was some, some stipulations in their covenant. If they rebelled, uh, things would happen to them. Their land would be taken away. They would be punished and so forth. And we actually see that playing out, right? As we read further along in the, in the Bible, we see that they, they, were, they did have their land taken away from them because of their rebellion and because they broke their covenant. And they still do that today, by the way, right? They still have a yearly atonement, the Day of Atonement in, in, in uh, Israel. I mean, they still believe that they're a, they're, they're a covenant people and they're atoning for their, for their sins. Yeah. Any others? All right, so I think we're good on time. So yeah, so next week we'll be talking about uh, the I, irresistible grace. And we'll flesh out a lot of things. Uh, Brother Ron brings up a good question about uh, you know, the measure of faith, the grace that is given. Is, is there any grace, uh, a small amount of grace given to unbelievers? Um, but one, one thing I think uh, you, you really, we really want to talk about, and I think a lot of people have questions with when we talk about these things, is also free will, right? Like, because that's, that's a big one, right? We're, how much free will do we actually have? You're saying that we are elected. 
God has chosen us? Do we even have any type of free will? So we'll talk a little bit about that next week when we talk about irresistible grace because I think that's very interesting and I think a lot of people have questions on that. So let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you again for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to search your scriptures, Lord. We thank you, Lord, because, uh, Lord, you have given us, Lord, uh, so much in your word to, to learn from, to study on. Uh, Lord, and we just want to thank you for your grace, Lord. The whole reason, again, let us remember the whole reason we're talking about these things is to highlight your grace and to highlight, Lord, our salvation, that, that, that it was you that saved us, not ourselves, and that you have shown us so much mercy and you have looked so kindly upon us. And, Lord, it is nothing that we've done. It is all because of you.